I'm Doug Sillers. Uh, thanks for coming. We're going to talk about doing augmented reality on the web. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. And again, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm Doug. I'm originally from Seattle, Washington. Um, uh, but for the last four years, I've been a digital nomad traveling around Europe with my family. Um, so I do freelance developer relations. I got started with the web and native apps doing performance, helping apps and websites get faster. I wrote a book, if you're an Android developer, on how to do that. And if you want to download it, that's the URL. And I'll post the slides on Twitter so you can get them later. Um, I help people make their websites and their apps run faster. And that'll be a thread sort of going through this. Even though it's augmented reality, I'm going to make sure that the websites are fast. Um, and if you ever want to talk to me, I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet, so feel free to reach out about any of these things if you have any questions. Um, so virtual reality, like you start thinking about like going into these 3D worlds that you know exist only in computers. And when I think about VR, I typically think about something like this, where you take your smartphone and you smash it into a, a device, and then you, you, you can see this virtual world. And it's super awesome, super cool. Um, one of the issues, of course, is this isn't something that you just have in your bag, like, oh, a virtual world, right? This is something that you do at home or you do at the office, right? It's not something that you're carrying with you everywhere you go. Um, the great thing about this is that there's 3,000 of them on Amazon, and they're relatively cheap, right? You can get them for like 20, 20 euros, 20 pounds. Pick your, pick your uh, currency. Um, so augmented reality, does anyone remember these? Google Glass, Does anyone use a Google Glass? Nobody, one person. Um, really cool, best sunglasses I've ever owned. Um, they were great, you could get your tweets up in the upper right hand corner. So it's sort of augmented, but sort of not, but it was sort of the beginning of having people think about being in a world where you could have a screen in front of you while you were engaging with the rest of the world. Um, I kept wearing them because they were great sunglasses, but people kept staring at you funny because everyone was really worried that you were recording them because there is a camera on there. And so you started getting this sort of side eye. What Google didn't want you to know was that when you were recording video, I mean, these things had two little watch batteries back here, right? So if you're recording video, you had about 90 seconds of battery life. So like, no, people weren't recording video of you because they wanted to get their tweets in the upper right hand corner of their screen. Um, move on to the future. This is the HoloLens from Microsoft. Has anyone used a HoloLens? A few, a bunch of hands. That's awesome. What? That's not the HoloLens. It's a screenshot of an augmented reality device. But you get the idea. They're really awesome. Um, super cool. Um, the trick is, of course, uh, they start off at about three thousand. You know, the HoloLens is about three thousand um, dollars. These are, you know, it, these aren't everyday things. Again, it's something you've got to put over your head to, um, to e e experience. Um, they may get smaller. They may start to look like regular glasses. Again, this is not something that everybody's carrying around with them to get into augmented reality. Um, however, lots of people have smartphones, right? There are billions of smartphones out there. And if you can do augmented reality in a smartphone, you know, now all of a sudden you've got a huge audience of people who are interested in doing these sorts of things. So, of course, when you start talking about augmented reality in a smartphone, the first thing everyone thinks about is Pokemon because, right, that was the sort of pivotal moment where people are like, hey, look, Krabby's in my front yard and I can catch him. Um, and that was super cool. Everyone loved it. Do you remember when this came out, it crashed all the time? Right, it was horrible. Um, and as a performance engineer, I'll tell you why. Um, basically, this app had a bunch of APIs going back to the, the, the Ninantic Lab server, like where they're all HTTPS. So I'm assuming it was like, where's Doug? Where are the Pokemon? Where are the gyms? Where is, you know, all these different APIs. And rather than using one connection and sending the data back and forth on one connection, each phone had six connections going back to the Ninantic Labs. So if they had, if their servers had capacity for six million connections, that wasn't six million users, it was actually one million users. And so they were getting all sorts of IP port collisions. Um, some people call that a distributed denial of service attack. Um, but that's what was happening with this application. But we're gonna talk about what's happening today. And what's really neat is that we can do augmented reality and virtual reality in the browser. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do today in the browser, and then what's coming up in the very near future. Um, has anyone used A-Frame before? Few, few hands. Awesome. Great. This is going to be a talk about A-Frame, which is an uh, open source project out of Mozilla. It's really easy to get started with, and you can start doing virtual reality and augmented reality in the browser really, really quickly. Um, we're going to build some websites today, or I'm going to show you how I built these websites. Um, in Notepad, right? Like, like a psychopath. I mean, this is what it looks like. It's like 12 lines of code, and you've got a virtual reality on, in the browser, right? So web, web developers, web developers, right? This is all familiar stuff, right? You've got the head, you've got the body. In the middle, we've got this A scene, and that's your A-frame scene, and we just have a, add a box, a sphere, a cylinder, a plane, and a sky. And you add a bunch of parameters to it, and then you have a web page. And so what does that look like? Um, I think I have it open. Where's my mouse? I do. Here it is. Right? This is the web page. It's got a box. It's got a sphere. You know, this is the hello world for A-frame. And that's all it is. So with like, you know, 11 or 12 lines of code, you've built a virtual experience that you can walk around, you can experience. There's, I'm not sure why it's bouncing. I think that's just something weird with my computer today. Um, but you know, you, there's no physics. You can walk through things. But like, this is you know, virtual reality on, in the browser. Super cool, super straightforward. Um, we want to build an art gallery as part of this. So, oh, we'll just walk through it really quickly. We add the JavaScript for A-Frame. Um, this is an older version because it's an older slide. Um, I add a scene, and inside that scene, I apply boxes, spheres, cylinders, planes, skies, and things like that. Um, we're in three dimensions. So we have X, Y, and Z. I'm an American. I'm trying to. Do, do we say Z in Sweden or Z? Z. Okay. I was in I was in England, and they kept telling me Z. So I'm going to try to say Z. Um, but so Z, Z is this way, so if you're looking into the screen, if you want stuff to be in front of you, you have to put it in the negative Z direction so that it's behind the screen, which is a little weird. Um, but everything else is fairly straightforward. You can rotate it on three different axes, right? You can change the colors. You can do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, I want to build an art gallery, so what I did is I generated a bunch of planes to build a box that I'm going to stand in, and what that looks like is um, it looks like this. All right, so I, I left the hello world in there, but you can see I'm in, a, I'm in a box, basically. I don't know why it's bouncing. That's weird. All right, but one weird thing is if you don't... Sorry about that. I just jumped. I don't know what happened. If you don't, for each plane, you have to define a color on both sides. And because I didn't define a color on the outside wall, they're invisible, which is why when you walk through the wall, there's nothing on the other side. So, right? It's just sort of a weird thing there. But so I built this room. It's got a blue ceiling and sort of green walls. We're building an art gallery. And so what I want to do is I want to apply some art to the gallery. So a frame room. And now I've added scream on the wall of, of my art gallery, right? Whoa, I, that was super fast. Um, so there it is. You can go to the outside and turn around, and it's hanging in negative. You know, there's, the wall isn't there, but it's just hanging there. Which, and so how does this work? Um, basically, I add an asset, which I, it's an image asset, which I call sc with the ID Scream. I have the image hosted up on Cloudinary. It's a cloud-hosted uh, image hosting service, media hosting service. Um, so I've got the image hosted there, and then for the box, I just apply the source screen, and there we go. Um, so what did I do? I put it at negative four, so it's on the front wall, that negative Z. Um, I put it two meters up, because you don't put priceless art on the floor. Um, and then for the scale, I just, Wikipedia tells me that it's 91 centimeters by 73 centimeters, so that's how I came up with the size, right? Um, we're going for realistic here. Um, as, as realistic as we can. So, like, it's actually a really small piece of art if you're standing in front of it. Like, it's, 
it's really neat because you can see that I was at a weird angle there, right? It was totally like trapezoidal there for a second, but it's a really small little piece of art there. Um, I gave it a third dimension of 10 centimeters, so it sort of has that, you know, wraparound look. But if you look really carefully, on the edge it's just screen smashed really, really small on that little bit. So that's, you know, it's, that's all it is. Um, you can animate it, so you can actually see that. So I'll just do that. Right, so you can sort of see that Scream is on all six sides of this sort of pizza box of art. Um, so you can do all sorts of animations and rotating, and so obviously all I did here is add an animation that auto plays and rotates around all three axes for five seconds forever, just because I can. Um, but, you know, we're in this world of virtual reality, like Scream is up in Norway somewhere, um, but we could add the Mona Lisa, we can add a Picasso. Uh, Mona Lisa's in, in uh, Paris, the Picasso from the Prado in, uh, in Madrid. I think Starry Night is also in Paris, but I'm not sure exactly which museum. Uh, but we're going to add them all in one place. And then, so these are all images. You'll also notice that I have an asset here. It's a GLTF file, and it's Michelangelo's David. So, like, if we're going to add art to a room, we should go big, right? Um, so... And here it is, right? They're all really small, right? Have you ever been to like, you go to the Louvre and there's like a thousand people clamoring to see the Mona Lisa and you walk up and you're like, wow, that was really small. Oh, it is bouncing like crazy on me. Let me reload that page here. All right. Um, so those, those, that's the actual size of all three of those pieces of art. The, uh, the Picasso is actually five meters wide. So I actually had to shrink it down to fit in the room, the room. Um, and so that's really easy to do. Like, all I did was um, I just defined the scale as smaller than it should have been, and it goes up onto the wall. So that's the Picasso. But then I was thinking, you know, if we're making stuff smaller, why don't we make stuff bigger, right? I mean, this is, we can play around with this stuff. It doesn't have to be re as re that realistic. So I'm not sure what's going on here. It's, there we, it's still doing that bounciness. That's kind of terrifying. All right, I'm just going to reload the page. All right, so like, you can walk around. You can see it if it's behaving. Let me try with the arrow keys. It's not any better. Weird. All right, the joy of doing live demos in front of an audience. All right, and then in the back over here, if it, it hasn't loaded yet, but Michelangelo's David will appear once it's fully downloaded. And I just reloaded the page, so it may take a second. Let's see if anything's happening in the dev tools here. It hasn't arrived yet. Um, so we'll talk about why that is the case. Um, and oh, there he is, he, so he showed up, right? So thanks, David, for finally arriving at, at my talk. But there's David in 3D, he's a 3D model. And you can, like, I'll try to move around without it being too janky here. But um, there he is hanging out. In, in, in the 3D room. So why did David take so long? Oh, well, let's go to the next part. We're going to add a new ceiling to the room. Um, and again, if, if you're adding a ceiling to uh, your art gallery, you ought to go big, <laughs> right? Just let's just throw the Sistine Chapel in there too, right? Because like, we can do whatever we want. It's virtual reality and it's fun. So again, how did I do that? As I grabbed this from Wikipedia, and then I just wrapped it around a cylinder and only show half the cylinder. So theta from zero to 180, and I put it on the ceiling. So like, it's just kind of fun. We're doing all sorts of fun stuff just to make it. Um, let's see, if, you're, if, you're, if I'm not careful, I can walk right through David, and I feel a lot safer. He's hollow on the inside. It's not working. It's just, it, it's a weird angle for walking through David because it's a very personal area that you end up, the, 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 the anyway, yeah, it's probably not appropriate to do. Um, but this model of David is a GLTF model, which is a standard 3D model. You can export from all your 3D rendering tools to create a GLTF model. And then, you know, I download this from a website where they have all sorts of models you can download and play with. Um, the trick is, of course, it's 26 megabytes to load onto the web page. 
And that's why it was taking a little while to appear in the back of the room. And then you're like, oh, there's David, magical. Um, so like the issue here is this is a really big file. And it's just like if you take an image with your camera, it might be like eight or nine megabytes. You don't put that on your website until you actually make it smaller so that it's suitable to load on the web. We need to do the same thing here too. So we're going to talk about optimization because that web page is 30 megabytes. And that's a little big. We saw that it took a little while for it to load. So we're not going to forget optimization because that's sort of like my bread and butter and I love talking about that. Um, but let's go in a little bit into AR. And so with A-Frame, there's another library you can add called AR.js. And there's some things you have to add now because all of a sudden we're in augmented reality. And because we're in augmented reality, we have to start thinking about cameras. Like where is your phone in relation to the rest of the room? And they also have this um, idea of markers. And so you can see here, I have a hero marker. And this is the default marker inside um, AR.js. And what it does is when your camera sees that, it will apply a 3D model to, um, <coughs> to that area of, your augment of, of the real world. It'll add an augmented reality part to it. But that's all cool. But what if you did it with a uh, QR code? So now this is the interactive part of the talk where everybody pulls out their phones. And you're going to pull out a barcode reader and scan that barcode. And I tested it, and it worked. And it's going to load a web page. And the other cool thing is the marker is also marking a 3D model. So that when the web page loads, you should see a 3D model appear when you hold it up to the screen. Is it working? It worked. All right. So to me, this is really cool because it's already working for some of the people in the room. And all they had to do was pull up their phone, scan it, and now they load a web page, and they're getting augmented reality just by holding their phone up to that barcode again. And so if you hold that up, um, if it doesn't work, there's a, there's a bit.ly URL down here in the corner. But I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, We're going to inspect this page. And so here's my phone. Right, and when my phone finds that, the barcode, it um, puts Scream in front of it. So where I think this is really neat is now all of a sudden you have a, a very, very low barrier way for anyone with a smartphone with a barcode scanner to load a web page and see a virtual reality experience or an augmented reality experience. And I think that's super cool. Um, you know, you know the, where, where I think this is super powerful is you, with just a barcode. Like you don't, that people don't know what to do with. A lot of people know if they see a QR code, they can scan it and see an augmented reality experience, which I think is super cool. You can create your own markers. So if you create a barcode, then you can use this tool uh, in the URL to generate the marker. And the marker basically is any image surrounded by this black um, border. And um, when you run this generator, it creates two files for you. It creates a PNG that you can put in your PowerPoint slides or print out or do whatever you want to do. And then it creates a .patt file, which is used in, by, the, um, by the JavaScript. And so for each marker, I have a URL to the .patt file. And when, the, when it's that, P, that file is seen in the camera, it applies the Mona Lisa. And so... That actually works on this next page, if you go to that page. And so like I'm super not, I was being super not creative when I created my pattern files and I made a giant number one. And, uh, but it works. Like when I find the giant number one, you can see there's a Mona Lisa. And if you look really carefully, it's Mona Lisa's all the way down. Um, the number, t this, this picture over here, 
Let's see if I can get that up to appear on the screen. If we do this, maybe it'll work. This is me being, again, not super creative, like the picture of me, shows a picture of me. Um, you know, again, it's just like, what pictures do I have on my computer today that I can work with? All right, so, you know, and what's neat about this is number one shows the Mona Lisa. It just worked. It has a little trouble with glare sometimes. Number one shows the Mona Lisa. Number two shows Scream. Number three shows the Picasso. And uh, my favorite one is number four. If it loads, it's the pigeon view of David. <laughs> right? Only the pigeons of Florence and us get this view. And the reason is the base is where the thing is. Uh, is the is is where the it's basing it the marker is the ba uh, basing the on the the base of the the statue. The other cool thing we can do is we can change the URL. So if I change the URL to a different website, I think it's it's two. I reload the page. And it's album art from the Beatles. Right? So you can imagine you can do this with JavaScript. It doesn't have to be a separate page, but you can serve different content to different people really, really easily just with JavaScript or with them changing their parameters, loading a different web page. You can serve different content with different markers, with the same markers. So people could be in an art gallery and someone could be seeing Cubist art and someone else could be seeing Impressionist art. There's all sorts of fun things we can do with this. Um, and it's all pretty straightforward and it's all really easy HTML to do. Um, so I think that's really exciting. So optimizations, this is the video of that web page loading on a slow 3G connection. I think it's playing. It's not playing. Yeah. Steadicam. Totally still. So I think part of it is, um, let's go back to that one. I made that way too big. Right, so you're saying because it's moving around the, the Beatles album. Let me see if I can put, sorry, I didn't realize that was. Where it's shaking a little bit. I think the technology is getting, I think it's getting better, but you're right, like small movements here have big effects on the way it appears on the screen. I'm not sure about that one. I don't know. Right, and it's still there. And so that's what's coming, and we'll talk about that soon, because there is, that is something that's coming really, really soon. Um, so I'm a performance guy. You can see this web page is taking a long time to load. We want this to load quickly. Um, so what are some ways we can optimize this? The first thing that we can see here is uh, from DevTools is that Starry Night is 1.8 megabytes, and that's a little big. That's just what I downloaded from Wiki Commons when I downloaded the image. Um, A-Frame is based on 3.js, and one thing inside 3.js is that all the images, the dimensions have to be a power of two. And so in this case, my browser is resizing it to uh, 1024 by 1024. Well, if we know every browser is going to resize it to 1024 by 1024, we might as well just do that on the server so it only has to, has, only has to happen once. Um, so I'm using Cloudinary, which is a really easy tool to do that. I can just add the, uh, in the URL, I can add the height 1024 and it'll resize the image for me automatically. So now I don't have to worry about the browser needing to resize the images for me. Um, the other thing that is uh, interesting is all, when I built the page, um, all of the images were downloading twice. And so that was interesting. And it turns out that inside 3.js, if it was a cores problem, so if there's a cross-origin thing and I was hosting it on a separate server, um, 3.js is like, ah, oh, that didn't have a cross-origin. I'll just download it again with the cross-origin. So it was downloading all of the images twice. So obviously the fix here is just to add a cross-origin policy to all my third-party, the images on a third-party third, third party server. That fixed that, so they're only downloading once. Um, I did some optimizations on the image quality. So when you lower quality of JPEGs, 
um, you can introduce artifacts. Um, in this case, I'm using a Q-Auto, and what that does is it reduces the quality of the image to where the human eye can notice a difference. So as humans, we can't tell that the image is of a lower quality, but it's smaller, so it's going to download faster. I added a format auto, and what this does is it'll serve it instead of a JPEG if WebP is smaller. WebP is supported in all the major modern browsers except Safari. Um, it could serve uh, a WebP. I think Safari's working on it. They're actually working on the bug to add WebP, which is exciting. Um, but in this case, what it does is it serves this as a WebP, and the image went from 1.8 megabytes to 300K. Pretty good savings. I ended up going to 512 by 512, and it went down to 93K. Right? That's super, that's totally reasonable for an image. I'm happy with that. Um, the GLTF files, um, there's a tool out there called Draco Compression, and what it does is the bin file is all the points in 3D space, and then it wraps the images around it. The GLTF file is basically XML that ties it all together. Um, but Draco Compression removes a bunch of the points in 3D space so that it still looks good. Um, and when I did this, it went down to like three megabytes. It's still a big file, but it's not 25. So that's a huge improvement, and it makes the page load a lot faster. It's, it's a binary file. I, I don't know. I, um, I, couldn't, I, I didn't even bother looking at it. I just used the compression to make it smaller, and it was smaller, and it still looked good. Um, so like, we can do a lot of stuff to make these things smaller, which is really exciting. Um, and what's really neat is we can do all of this today. This is all built into AR.js um, AR and into A-Frame, and it all works, and it's pretty exciting and pretty fun. Um, what's coming up, and it will be out probably by the end of this year, is the WebXR um, API. And they're calling it WebXR instead of Web ARVR just because it's fewer uh, syllables, I guess. Um, this is a screenshot from earlier this year, um, but this API is you know, now finalized and is going to come out soon. If you read down here, when I took the screenshot, it was an unstable API, and basically it says, um, any examples that you build are going to break because we're changing the spec. Um, and so the demo I'm about to show you runs on Android 8. It requires uh, Chrome Canary from a year ago. Um, which, of course, you can't get anywhere except for one of those sketchy APK download sites and then sideloading it onto your phone. Um, you have to turn on a bunch of flags. You have to turn on AR core. Um, and then you get it all set up to run your demo. You go to bed, and then you wake up the next morning, and uh, Google Play has updated your Chrome Canary to the most recent version. So I have forced uh, my phone to keep this ancient version of Chrome Canary on my phone so that I can run this demo to show you what it does. Um, but what's really cool, what's in it today is the browser can actually identify um, horizontal and vertical surfaces and then apply, you know, augmented scenes to those surfaces. And so that's, that's the demo I'm going to run right now. So I'm just going to open up that page really quickly. Oh, I have to open it up in my funky canary. It's, so it's, it is going to be finalized, and it will be in its... Uh, I think it's in Chrome behind a token right now. So if you, you can actually do it... Um, we'll just give this a second here. Chrome Canary, come on. There it is. All right, so it says this is the demo with the WebXR device API, and so I start the augmented reality. And it, this little f graphic is telling me to move the phone around so it gets an idea of the room. And then I have, there's this little anchor that's going to appear. And it's pretty dark in here, so let's see if it shows up anywhere. Oh, it's going to show up on the monitor right there. 
If I tap the screen, it's not going to work there. Let's put it on my computer, maybe. The water bottle. There we go. Ah, the Mona Lisa is now sitting on the table. It should be on the stairs, right? The Mona Lisa is on the stairs. And then, right, so now we have... My demo wasn't working this morning because my uh, three euro flying tiger USB cable that's like three meters long stopped working, so I fixed it today by buying another three euro flying tiger cable. But they all hold in space, like they kind of stay in the same location, and so it's just a JavaScript, right? I'm incrementing the counter, and every time I press the button, it just puts a new piece of art in 3D space. And so this is going to be live in. Chrome later this year, and it's going to be supported by all the other browsers as well, which is kind of cool. So now you get this sort of augmented reality scene, you know, live on and mobile phones, and it works in any browser. You know, it it it's pretty engaging and gets people interested. And um, this web page that when I first downloaded, I built this off of a demo that Google had built, and that stabilization GIF is 850 kilobytes and the anchor was 36 kilobytes. So again, performance guy that I am, I real, that's 1,024 by 1,024. We've got an off by one issue with the anchor. Um, so to optimize this, um, I'm not a big fan of animated GIFs. Usually I like to um, turn them into movies, but this needs to be transparent, so it needs to stay a GIF. But I realized that the only part that we care about is right there, where, you, you know, where the hand is moving. So I just resized it and cropped out all the other bits. And so I just made a 512 by 512, again, to keep it in the power of two uh, thing. And I just used that box right there. Um, and I did that with Cloudinary, just with a URL parameter, which is cool. And then I made it 256 by 256. And that took it down to 170K. Pretty good. Um, this I probably should have turned into an SVG to make it really small, but I just resized it to uh, 256 by 256, and it was two kilobytes, and I was cool with two kilobytes. Like, I just had to do a couple things in the URL, and I didn't have to create an SVG. So two kilobytes I was good with. Um, the cool thing is that whole page that I was just showing you with the Mona Lisa and, and, and Starry Night sitting here in front of my computer, that whole web page is 11 requests and 600K. Right? So we're doing augmented reality in a browser, um, and we're not breaking the bank by any stretch of the imagination. These aren't like, we're not downloading giant apps or huge uh, bundles of JavaScript. We're doing it in under a megabyte, and we're building really cool, engaging, you know, immersive experiences. And to me, I think that's really exciting. There's a lot of potential applications to building immersive experiences. And if you can do it in a way that it runs on everybody's smartphone, right, in the browser, right, you've already got a billion people who can use your app today. And to me, that's really exciting. Um, so augmented reality is available today on the web. Um, this augmented reality with hit points is going to be around, like, later this year. Um, and it doesn't have to be processor intensive. It doesn't use huge amounts of data. And it can be really easy and uh, a thing to build to build that immersive experience for people. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and um, all of the code and all of the web pages that I have are up on GitHub, um, and so you can play around with them, you can fork it, you can play with them, and that's a lot of fun. And then um, the WebXR spec if you're interested, and then I used Cloudinary to host all of my images because they're a really cool service. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions.